What's up guys, Colin Morrison, Scummy Unplugged, Recovery Today Magazine. This magazine is about helping people, getting over addiction, showing people that you can get over drug addiction and alcoholism, and just overcoming life problems that life throws at you. And uh, guess we have today, Aaron Baker, his story, what he's been through, how he's overcome, how he stayed sober through everything, when I think a lot of people wouldn't go down that road. It's purely remarkable, man. You and me have been friends for so long. Yeah. And I guess uh, let's just start off and kind of introducing who you are and how your life started as a professional motocross racer, where that took you down, where you're at now. It's a, it's a big question, but I mean, start it off. Who Starts are off. You? <laughs> well, I'm Aaron. You know okay, me. It's yeah. been, what, we've been friends 25 plus years? 20, over 25 years. Long yeah. time. And we come from the same cloth, like two wheels. Yep. A motorcycle was, you know, Santa's gift when I was three years old. And nothing compared to that thing. You know, that was the ultimate toy. All I wanted to do was ride. And even though my mom raised me in a really special part of California, which is the Monterey Bay, Carmel, mm -hmm. Um, she put a guitar in my hand. We traveled a lot. She was an importer. She exposed me to a lot of culture and enrichment, other things besides the dirt bike. She didn't want you to ride? She really didn't, although she was the rider in the family. She, what, she had a bike? Her whole family used to go out to the, the dry lake beds, and ah. she ripped around. She smoked my dad. <laughs> so she was the rider, but, you know, she didn't want me to go down that route so that's what i said she gave me all these other outlets to surf and skate and grow up most in moms are like that dude they know motocross is like the most dangerous sport and really quick like one thing i love it just hear you saying that is like motocrossers i don't see like other people finding love of, in what they do as strong as motocross dude you know like dirt bikes have the same thing it's like you literally live breathe sleep like yeah everything motocross sleep man. with that little motorcycle yeah. i would sleep out in the garage right next to it <laughs> i love that thing i so, hear you yeah that was um that was my passion from my earliest memories so was you that know, your goal to become a professional racer at a young age yeah pretty much i mean that's all i wanted to do although carmel is a sweet place and i loved board sports and i had a ton of freedom and i saw quite a lot as a kid you know, third world countries and just exposed to a lot. I would go to the races and somehow I, I knew that there was more yeah. to the world and to life than just riding my dirt bike, but it still didn't matter because I just loved what I was doing. Seeing those countries, you mean racing? No, it was, bef I mean, my mom tried to relocate my sister and I to Indonesia when we were really young. So who does that? Why? This is new to me. I want to hear yeah, this. Yeah, no, this is this is not many families living in like on the beach. Hey, we're going to Indo Indonesia. What's that all about? That's Toots. That's okay. My mom's a cool chick. That is rad. She, um, you know, she wanted us to grow up with a really, I guess, open mind. And she saw that I was so focused and passionate towards just one thing, which yeah. was the dirt bike. Yeah. She really wanted to broaden that perspective and so taking my sister and me to a third world country at the age of eight you know was pretty impactful and although you know it wasn't like I was really absorbing it at the time subconsciously I really was so later in life in my late teens as I turned professional it's like I was turning pro riding a dirt bike and I loved it but I was also coming of age and I wasn't making money and I had these other responsibilities and I was living on my own and I'm like having injuries going, what the hell am I going to do with my life? And there was something in the back of my mind that I just knew that there was more. Not many people think of that. No. That's why I think traveling is so good. When you don't travel and you're stuck in your town, you don't think like yeah. how lucky we are to like live. I know where you live, where I live, like how lucky we are, like other parts of the world. I mean, just to have a TV, it's like they're considered rich. Yeah. And what you're saying, not many professional athletes think about the other side. Well, that's, that's what where happens. That's where depression kicks in. That's where addiction comes in. That's what happened to me. You know, like, what the hell do we do? Well, so many people after their, you know, their time is up in whatever sport it is, can't manage their money. No. Can't manage life without 
you know, that outlet, that yeah. sport. And addiction is huge, man. Like I suffer all these just like anybody else. Yeah. I've just tried to figure out ways to manage myself so that I don't slide right down that really slippery slope. Well, let's get into like where the injury and everything. So you made it, you accomplished your goal. You want to become a professional motocross rider and you did. Yeah, I made a poster when I was 15. I wrote, I, Aaron Baker, will be a Supercross and Motocross national champion and I hug it above my bed. That's and then I won a Loretta Lynn's championship. Really? In 95, I won Loretta's, I won Ponca. I had a great amateur career and then 98 turned pro. Yeah. And then stiffy. Team Stiffy. And then uh, I was out just practicing, shaking a bike down. I was just testing it. So and this was, you were just practicing at a local track? In Simi, right off um, the old Honda test track back there. Okay. Honda Land. Okay, so just getting you ready You remember for behind it? Wilson's house? Yeah, that was in Moore Park. That yeah. was our, our joint. Our so joint. So it was just a local track behind Hill. So you were just going out there, practicing like we all do, normal day. Getting ready for the race this weekend, and then I actually want to hear this story. I know. So, you remember the track? I mean, it, it was a combination of like natural terrain and actual oh, built-up yeah. sections. Mm -hmm. It was the big left-hander down a straightaway to a big step up over the hill. Over that table tab, yeah. Third gear pinned. Yeah. I hit it, just like any other time, but it bogged. The bike just seized right on the transition, so it compressed me and bucked me in the ass, and I went. Like I stepped over the handlebars and I had plenty of momentum, so I cleared it and I'm just like rolling the windows up and I kept thinking I didn't want to land on my feet because I had new CTIs, yeah. new knee, knee braces. Can't ruin the CTI knee braces. So. And I didn't want to break the femur Yeah. because I just saw a friend break a femur because of those knee braces. Uh -huh. So that's what I was thinking as I'm like falling and I kept rotating over and I lawn darted, like I hit the ground my arms didn't stop me and it compressed my chin to my chest and I heard my neck just break. Uh, it sounds like um, if you were to snap celery, mm -hmm. like crunching, snapping. It was really loud, it's like a gunshot. And I rolled down the hill, down the downside of the jump and I laid there and the dust settled and my hand was in front of my face and I was barely breathing. My visor is all cocked, my goggles are full of dust. And this girl ran up to me and I just, with like the last breath of my body, just told her I broke my neck. Call a paramedic, call a helicopter. I knew that a paramedic wasn't gonna drive back there. So you knew you, bro you broke your it. neck right yeah, there. Could you like, feel your legs? I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't feel my hand, I couldn't feel anything. Which is a motocross rider, that is the number one worst fear. You know what's crazy, Colin, is I was riding at Raynard's track in Oklahoma like two weeks before that. Yeah. And I crashed really hard. And the first thing I thought of as I'm laying there is to wiggle my toes. I'd never had that thought before in my life. Yeah. But I'm laying in that red dirt and I'm like wiggling my toes. I'm like, all right, cool, I'm good. Got up, kept riding. And then two weeks later. Your whole world changes. From a jump, which is standard, you can do it with your eyes closed and that's with this sport, man. It wasn't even your fault. It was the bike's fault, which could happen to anybody. Life happens, man, fast. You want to know what this feels like? Take your hand and close your fist. Extend your ring finger. Put it on the... Try to raise your ring finger. I can't. So Imagine your arms and legs like that. I think everybody you guys just heard, try that when you're watching this. That's crazy. So that's what it feels like to not have any control over your whole body. And that's why your story and why you're here is, they made a, a documentary, it's on Netflix about you, man. You're, we'll go into all this. A helicopter came, picked you up. Rushed me to, to Los Robles. I remember because we were all there. I remember waiting in the, the parking lot of the hospital, like all of us, it was a very, it was a very scary thing because they all said like, you're paralyzed and you, dude, we hang out all the time. It was, uh, it's just the worst thing you want to hear about your friend. That's got to be a very dark time knowing your whole future is different. Your passions, you're not going to be able to ride dirt bikes again. 
your life, what it, what was going on in your head like the first couple of weeks in the hospital? I'm sure it was as low as a person can get. I would take it. It's low, but it's really you're in a state of, I was in a state of survival. Really? So you're not thinking long term. Long term. You're not contemplating the gravity of the situation. You're just trying to like live moment to moment, literally breath to breath, because six days after, you know, the injury, I was intubated on a ventilator like Russ. Yeah. And pneumonia is really common. And my lungs started to fill with fluid. And the doctors would come in, you know what the suction's like for Russ. They'd come in and do that multiple times a day. And on this one day, I was struggling. I could barely breathe. Therapist came in and she was about to suction my lungs, but there was an emergency somewhere else. So she left the room and handed that device to my dad. What? My dad's standing there going, what do I do with this? Can they do that? <laughs> she <laughs> did. And I can't breathe. I can't talk. I'm blinking and I'm trying to tell my dad that I'm basically suffocating. Oh and, my um, God. and I did. I suffocated to death. I remember the moment. I remember the machine flatlining. I remember struggling and then a release. Did I you remember pass out? It's not passing out. It was, it was um, kind of like instantly becoming a part of everything, my consciousness. Like imagine if a raindrop lands in the ocean, all of a sudden it's not a raindrop, it's, all, it's everything. Heavy. It's so that was like you were everything. Almost going to heaven, or like you like out, of, out of body. I hear this a but lot. But it's it's not out of body, and it's not any particular place, high or low, light or dark. There's for me, there's no form. It's just a like a infinite field of potential. You've seen the movie The Matrix. Yes. You know the end scene yeah. of the very first one where everything is just ones and zeros, but everything is ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. There's no distinction between his body, the walls. Infinity. It's just infinite. And those ones and zeros can manifest into a plant. It can manifest into a body. It can manifest into a chair. That's, in simple terms, the experience. Heavy. I like, I have goosebumps. I mean, what happened? How did you come back to life, dude? They, they shocked me back into life. They resuscitated me. So those me. people obviously came right yeah, back. Yeah, the, the, the emergency was back in my room, and so they, with the electric paddle, shocked me back to life. Like, here I go. I open my eyes again for the second time in my life, and it's basically like a rebirth of consciousness. I, I open my eyes to my grandmother, and I look at my mother, and all of a sudden, the paralysis didn't matter. Yeah. Like, I had another breath. I have another moment. You're on the earth. I'm here and now. And what I understood was that time, although it's a short amount of time we're here, even if you're 80 years old, Make that's a blip. That's the most important thing and love. And all you can do with time and love is to share it with each other. I feel that same way going through what I did, with, which was nothing what you went through, but I'm so glad I, I hit my rock bottom. It's, a, it's relative, dude. Because it's like I, I look at life totally different. It's not about working, making money to buy a house. It's just about having a good time, being a good person, loving one another, and just living. Because, dude, like, once you're gone, you're gone. And you always hear that, dude, if I was paralyzed, I would just... Somebody I said shoot me. I said that. I've said that a couple times too. Tell I'm around you and I'm around Russ. And Russ is in a wheelchair. I mean, he can't get water without somebody giving him the water. And he's like, you know what? Like, if I had a chance to walk again, I wouldn't. I, I'd be because I'm, I accepted who I am and I'm fine. That got, that took so much mm. and like it really understood a lot. And just what you're saying, it, it's so true. And I feel people sometimes need to hit a rock bottom to figure that out. It's I say not that, about that nice car. It's not about that nice house, man. Just live, you, get, you know? I say that often, man. Uh, unfortunately, That's heavy, dude. It takes a train wreck sometimes to really shake you up and recognize what's important in life. Yeah. And that I say it too, like Russ. Like, I wouldn't change a thing. This, this challenge and adversity has really taught me what's important. Yeah. And the relationships that I have, 
and the, the things that I spend my time and energy on. And all the on, people you've helped, dude. That's what it's about. Like, life is cyclical. Like, you're yeah. helping people and people help you. And it's just like, that's the, high, the best qualities of being human. It is. I wouldn't know that. And I tell people in, like, recovery, the, the best thing you can do is just help the other struggling addict. It's going to help you. It's going to help that person. And if that person does the same thing, it's like everyone's helping each other. And, like, Shit being, a good amazing. Person, being a good person is, like, you get so many rewards and things. And, like, in recovery, it's like you're, you're in rehab with nothing to your name. And, like, you just have to live one day at a time, make sobriety number one, and you'll get everything back. But you don't know how. You just got to live. And everything, dude, you're, you're just so motivational. Your, your story, how, what, after that, did you ever hit some really dark patches? I or still drugs? do. I yeah, still do. And that's normal. That's with everybody. I think that's the deal. I was asked this question the other night, like, how did I deal with it? And I, and I said, it's not a past tense thing. It's not that I dealt with it and I'm all good. Like, life is a hell of a ride. It is. And you constantly have to kind of stay on your game and do your best at managing the highs and lows. Mm -hmm. You know, the circumstances that arise. I can look at life and it either happens to me and I'm a victim and I suffer or it happens for me and I learn from it and I grow and I transcend it. But, you know, that's a f daily thing. It is. Because every day I wake up with a really difficult physical situation. And I have to make a conscious choice to get out of bed and to go through it. Mm -hmm. Like just to get here. There are a lot of difficult physical steps just to be in this chair sitting and here. I saw it walking up the steps just to get where you're at right now. It was, I could see it was a mission. It was like it's just to get up those steps, but you did it. You, it's like one step at a time, one second at a time. And I think that's what's consistent with our stories, you know, uh, maintaining sobriety. So you have to wake up and face the psychological aspect of, of addiction, yeah. of the adversity. You have to make a choice. Exactly. From moment to moment, because it's like right there. And I understand that with the community of, of people that are recovering addicts, because my sister's gone through it. I've lost two uncles mm -hmm. to severe addiction, my mother, my father, my grandparents. And I know how easily mm -hmm. I can Go become back an out. addict. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. become an addict really quick. Because I like it. Yeah, and what you were saying, like how life does throw its problems, like how I always post, I'm always so happy and like life is so good. But dude, sometimes I cried in my bed like a month ago, just depressed, thinking the world's out, of, like just weird emotions. So it's like yeah. life throw. it's not always perfect. Like, but without the drugs and the alcohol, you can manage and get over these bumps so much easier then if you think by snorting that line, you're gonna feel good, you're gonna think it's all good, but it's really not. It's like a fake, uh, just a fake feeling, I guess, but. I think it probably just compounds your problems. It does, but at the time you're getting high, you think it's like all good, but really it's like doing the opposite, man. But back to you, when, what was your next steps after you were in the hospital? Like when you started to realize your situation, how did you pick yourself up and what was the next step in your life after? That's a big change. So what was next for you there? Really, you know, the decision I made, I had one of two decisions. I could either succumb to the injury and just give up mm -hmm. and be a statistic like the doctor said. I would never have a chance, like one in a million chance of ever Go feeding myself. Go on pills, just numb out. And check out completely yeah, yeah, and yeah, just yeah. die. Yeah. Or I could work. And work is a general term, but what that means is that I could show up in my mind willing to go through whatever that was. And by doing that, I was able to repay the love and support that my mother and my father and sister and family and friends were giving me. Mm -hmm. How else was I to repay that? Yeah. They were the lighthouse for me. They were that beacon of like light and hope that I couldn't really see otherwise. So I decided I'm going to work. And that means not trying to get back to what was, which was a different life. Mm -hmm. This is rebuilding my life forward, redefining myself completely. Because before the accident, hi, I'm Aaron Baker, I race motocross. Yeah. Like that's my identity. That's not who I am now. So that's a, it's basically a blank canvas, right? Yeah. You gotta like repaint, repaint it. it. Yeah. 
So that's how we started was I just showed up mentally and said, all right, let's do it. And so my mother facilitated the rehab opportunities for me and we were all in. I mean, rehab, seven days a week, four to six hours a day. When did you make your first step? The first little thing was the story of Ariel, Ariel my wow. sister, painting my toes yep. with her nail polish. You can tell that story for those that <laughs> haven't seen the documentary. My toes yeah. actually need a new paint job. I still paint my toes today. <laughs> um, she thought it would be funny um, as I'm laying there in the hospital with my bare feet that she would take her nail polish and paint my toes like rainbow colors. Yeah. And I was pissed, but she's like, if you can kick me, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a jerk, but um, I humored her and she did it. And my toes look like Skittles. <laughs> but I would lay there and I would stare at my toes and I would imagine colors of light moving energy through my body, blue, red, green, yellow and trying to connect my brain, my mind, down to the nerves and to my muscles. And it was my left blue toe that twitched first. And when, it, when that thing twitched voluntarily, when I thought about it and made it move, I was like, see, like mom, everybody, doctors, this is real, like th I can do yeah. this. And that was the first little glimmer of hope. And I kept wiggling that toe for weeks and months and it turned into like slight movements and twitches and I was able to then scratch an itch on my nose and give my dad a hug for Father's Day. And like I just built on it over years. Yeah. Years. Jesus. I mean, I'm 20 years post-injury now. And um, each one of those little flickers of movement were huge like milestones of improvement. I, yeah. I mean, we partied whenever that something new would happen, like we all celebrated and we acknowledged it and, and said that's, that's progress. It's so crazy what the mind can do. Like it really, I would say 95% was up there, you know? If you didn't like really there. think you could do it, you might still be in a bed right now. Yeah, well I mean the, the amount of like, I call it focused, willed intent. Like how I'm able to focus on something and put all of my energy into that one spot is, I guess, equivalent to if you were to like stand on your hands right now and really balance and then go walk down the stairs on your hands. That's how much like mental focus, physical strength, balance and coordination it takes for me to make that happen on my feet. They all have to align perfectly and it all comes from up and, here. And that's a conscious thing. like. It's not just happening. Yeah. If you think about like a computer processor, like my bandwidth is maxed out. So walking and chewing gum is like a little too much. That's crazy, man. And that's why your story is crazy. So then, you know, fast forward a little bit. After everything you've been through, I want to go ride a bicycle across America. And that's why, dude, so we need to nominate you for president or something. Because like your whole story of like overcoming so much and then the milestones that I am pretty much 100% healthy. I would no way I would do that. You know, I'd really have to push myself. But for for you, it's so much bigger. How did that idea come up? Uh, the and idea of cycling was really natural. Yeah, I think early on when I was induced on morphine and stuff in the hospital. I had these crazy dreams about riding a bike in Europe. I had long hair, I was in chamois. That's right. Hallucinating. <laughs> I got off that stuff like within the first couple of weeks, but those were the dreams I was having. And you know, we all cycled mm -hmm. as training. We all come from BMX and mountain bike. Yeah. And that's just natural if you ride a dirt bike. Um, so like instinctively I knew that cycling was gonna be really good to make these connections really strong connections mm -hmm. because it's repetitive motion and the more you do something the better that connection is mm -hmm. and so that's why a bicycle was like yeah I need to figure out how I can ride a bike and it started in the in the rehab center where they would hook electrodes to my legs and they would fire the muscles and stimulate me to pedal a recumbent and I'd do that for hours on end and then I saw a tandem bicycle on the wall I never even contemplated a tandem bicycle in my life. Yeah. Like, who would ride that lane? Yeah, thing? yeah, yeah. I wouldn't ride that. 
But for the situation, those circumstances, I was like, hmm, I definitely could sit on the back. I could be taped to the handlebars and to the pedals, and, and I'll just going. sit back there and grind. And somebody will ride the front of it, and we'll just ride for miles. And it was Toots. It was my mom that said she would ride with me. The original rider, right? Full circle, dude. Full circle. So she gets on the front, and like I said, they, they strapped me to the back, and I could barely sit there. I would collapse on the seat. So barely five minutes, worked it up to five miles, to 10 miles, to then putting a goal of the LA Marathon. Like, because I'm super goal oriented, I need something to like work towards. Otherwise, like recovery is just way too broad. It's overwhelming starting from there and like, let's say go across America or back to drug addiction and rehab thinking I have nothing and then you look at life like dude how am I gonna get the house a kid it's so overwhelming but that's where the one day at a time one breath at a time like just get start small goals here and then this and that's why I tell people for me that's how it works small goals and over time you'll get it all back one flicker one flicker at a time is saying start from painting toes and then one toe two toes legs moving this this then get. one pedal stroke two pedal strokes ten thousand like it adds up and so every mile we were covering, I just kept stacking chips. And so that's yeah. why it, the LA Marathon made sense. sense. It was 26.2 miles, totally doable, trained for two years, and my mom and I made it happen. And then from that, we did a second, and then we did a third. So three LA Marathons, and I'm bored, going, we need something different. And she and I were talking to a group of um, patients and we were just telling them the story of recovery and you know, it's possible. And, and I blurted out, I'm like, shit, if we're riding this bike in all these marathons, why don't we just do it like Forrest Gump? <laughs> and she looked at me like I'm nuts and the audience was like, are you kidding? And, but that was like a public declaration, so I better put my money where my mouth is. Yeah. And so that's where it started and that was the goal. So I thought of it like a race effort, called my sponsors, raised the money, Bought a motorhome, put yeah. the sponsor stickers on the motorhome, and trained myself physically to be able to sit for eight hours a day on the back of a tandem. Unbelievable. Got some of my best friends together and my mom. And June 10th, 2007, we started from Dog Beach, San Diego. And we pedaled 3,182 miles across the southern tier of the states, all the way to St. Augustine, Florida. Unbelievable, dude. Three and a half months. Was there times in that ride, riding across America, where you wanted to give up, or like, did you ever hit a couple of rough patches? Which I was at that point, like, within the team dynamic. I mean, we had seven people circulating on and off the team, and mm -hmm. living on a motorhome and struggling through the summer months, hundred plus heat. Like riding a bicycle every day for thirty to sixty miles is brutal. I too. So it tested all of us. I never felt like I wanted to give up just because I was super hell bent on just doing this. Yeah, the goal. But I mean, we had to cut days short. We had to take some days off. Like we had to like reassess the situation. We had to hire and fire. Like it was, you know, it was hard. How was that getting to the that last mile? I'm sure it had to be emotional for all you guys, man. Tears, man. I bet. Oh, I mean, uncontrollable. We pedaled right, literally into the sand and fell over in the sand on the beach in Florida. And we just like teared up and hugged each other and popped champagne and like sprayed each other down and just like didn't drink any of it, but we got pretty sticky. <laughs> and then went right into the water and we really couldn't wrap our heads around what was just done. It's amazing just from like going back for you just spitting out that comment and then riding to this sand in the east coast so you can't go no further it's it's just rad what the human body can do with the mind if you have the will and the strength to do something you could really overcome anything and in your situation you know for a normal person that's so gnarly and like for you in your situation it's it's so much bigger and sure that story helps so many people dude like your I, your story thanks bro i i mean i do really enjoy sharing it yeah. Um, but then that's not it. For a lot of people, they'd wrap it up. Then, you know, I did the bicycle thing. Why don't I take my walker and walk across the desert? I mean, well, I did ride. Like I rode. Good idea. I rode a, a second tour the, the following year. 
Okay. On my own bike. Across America? Twice, yeah. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. By yourself? So, okay, yeah. once wasn't enough. I'm going to go do it again so by I was myself. So I was tired of sitting shotgun. Yeah. As I said, I didn't like the tandem bike. So I built a, my own bike. It had two wheels in the front, one in the, or two wheels in the back, one in the front. And I pedaled this time under my own power from San Francisco, 4,202 miles to Washington, D.C. And my mom rode alongside me. No way. And that was in 2008. Dude. And then we started from there, the Paralympic racing for the, the Paralympic program. And that was exciting because I got to work alongside these coaches and these other athletes with crazy conditions, you know? Veterans that have, you know, amputees, brain injuries, cerebral palsy, like a lot of really difficult situations. But these people transcended that and they were just there doing what they loved living moment to moment, giving 100% effort every day to chase an Olympic dream. And being in that kind of company really <laughs> fired me up. I bet. Because I wasn't the only one doing this shit. Like, these people are way gnarlier than me. So it really humbled me down and kept me on my grind, pursuing my absolute best, whatever that was. And so... I didn't make the Olympics. I almost did. I won a national championship. I got sick two days before the World Cup, which is that. the final selection race for the Olympics. And I got a bladder infection. Oh. So like I trained for three and a half years to make the Olympics. And then literally like in 10 minutes, it Gone. was done. Uh, you know, maybe it was meant to be. There's I agree. different ways you can look at that with a lot of things in life, dude. I look at stuff like that like it was meant to be. Who knows why, but, you know. You have to look at it that way, man. Otherwise, you'll drive But look at all the training that you did that you got and, like, probably the people that you helped by, like, dude, you know, I'm having a tough day, but Aaron, he just, dude, you hear his story? He went across America. So, like, everything you did leading up to that helped so many people. So it was a win. That's, I'm sure you kind of... That's exactly it. Yeah. That process, not the destination, mm -hmm. right? That cliche saying, it's the journey. That's the truth. It is. Those people, that experience, what I learned about myself in that whole process is beautiful. And I wouldn't change that because if I'd gone and won a medal, very few people in the world would relate to that. But everybody can relate to having a goal, sacrificing for it, you know, having the expectation and then shit changes. You fall off the wagon, you, you know, you stumble and we get back up. And that's relatable. It's crazy in life, like how really easy it is, I would say, for a lot of addicts and stuff going back. Like it's really right there in front of you. It really is. You got to get sober. It makes the right number one. You'll get your whole life back. But it's how you process it. Like just how you're saying it, it's it's all right there. You just have to put the work in. You gotta you be know, willing. Like, what's the saying? Like, if you're gonna go through fire, go. Yeah. Like, keep walking. You just have to be willing to do it. Uh huh. And don't stop. If you do, you're screwed. Exactly, and that's with everything. Addiction is just if you fuck up, you relapse. Just get back up and go again. Keep going. Do it again. Go again. Brandon Novak sitting in that same chair. He went to rehab 13 times. 13th one worked and I on the news and he was doing a, a speech about drug addiction you know now he's like the number one guy that talks about sobriety worldwide 13th time dude so I mean he's a perfect example that's you a beautiful are. example when did you walk across the desert what was that, that was that was your last big one that's the last yeah like real big physical effort on the heels of that Olympic bid I didn't make it and there was a short two weeks where I just pulled back. I was a little depressed about it. I was, you know, going through that cascade of emotions. I needed to regroup and set a different goal for myself and set the bicycle aside. I had done everything I could mm -hmm. on that bicycle and I was grateful to it. But now I wanted to change and move forward. And I was in the grocery store I was walking, pushing a grocery, uh, grocery cart, and I felt really stable. When I walk, it's um, unbalanced, it's sketchy, I can fall, it's dangerous. 
and it's difficult. But when I hold on to something like that grocery cart, it felt pretty good. And when I was outside walking to the car, the wind was blowing and I still felt stable. And I thought, shit, I need to just keep going. Like walk across the parking lot and 10 times further. And it occurred to me that, you know, on my way to Vegas, I've seen some really beautiful open desert mm -hmm. out there, glass flat. And those, those images you've seen on postcards of like the stone that looks like a snail. Yeah. I'm like, that's me. That's totally me. And I thought, Death Valley, I'm going to do that. <laughs> so heavy, dude. So I did. I, I mean, that was the idea. I told my buddy, who is a, a cameraman, a great filmmaker, I said, this is my idea. Would you point a camera and actually be kind of a plan B for me if I needed help getting out of there? That you could help get me out, keep me safe? Yeah. He said, yes, we put the, the plan together. I trained for it. I bought a jogging stroller, like for a baby. Uh -huh. You see a yeah, mom yeah, jogging. Yeah. I bought a, a jogging stroller off eBay and I modified it with a solar panel and batteries and carried my own food and water and one umbrella. So heavy. And walked 20 miles across Death Valley. Which is so gnarly and I almost feel like we need to stop at that story because you have a documentary out on Netflix, Coming to My Senses. And it documents everything we talked about. Yeah. And for, I'm sure, a lot of people, like, if you just hear the story, seeing it, like, because I'm, like, listening to your story, but I, I've seen your movie so many times, it's so heavy, dude, because just you doing it, the, like, everybody needs, go on Netflix, Coming to My Senses, to watch Aaron's Journey. Um, so it's on Netflix, where else can people see it? Uh, they don't I think have you Netflix? can see it on iTunes, Amazon iTunes, Amazon, YouTube has it now. You can buy it on YouTube, and it's so amazing, man. It's it's crazy. You're a very remarkable guy. Um, something Russ told me is kind of the same situation. Like for drug addicts and alcoholics, you know, we have the choice. I had the choice to go to rehab, stay in there for 30, 90 days, whatever. Listen to what they say. Get my shit together. I'm gonna come out a new guy. Perfect. But like you and Russ and people in your situation, you guys don't have that chance to just go do a 30 day treatment center and come out and run again and have perfect, you know? And it, I, that, that stuck to me so much and that's where I feel like you guys' story is gonna really help people out there with a drug addiction problem, you know? Like, I can really do this. I can like, in your story, like, dude, if you can ride across America, you can walk across the desert in a, in, you know, going, a snail's pace, but you did it. Like, you can overcome anything, dude. Like, drug addiction, people fall in ruts in life, and it's just how you get out of them. But you can get out no matter what. Or ride them. Ride them, yeah. Ride like, that see, ride. See, it's funny the how I apply so much of the stuff I learned on a dirt bike to life. Yeah. And business and struggle. So, I mean, yeah, you're in a rut. What are you going to do? You ride the rut. You actually kind of pin it. And just hit that and rut look perfect ahead. And, and you look ahead like a motocross fundamental. To ride a rut, you come in with momentum, you get your braking down, you settle into it, and you look ahead and you actually roll on the gas and you find yourself out of it. That's a great analogy, man. So again, when you're going through it and you're in the rut, just keep going. Don't chop the throttle, don't back off, don't hesitate. Just pin it. And don't give up. If and you fall stop. in that rut, get back up and just ride out of it. That's so it. I always tell people to kind of close this out because I really just want people to watch this documentary. And we'll have a teaser in this section. What do you tell somebody? And I feel like we've already kind of explained it. What do you tell somebody that is in that hole of addiction, alcoholism, they lost everything, lost their wife, husband, they don't have any light at the end of the tunnel. What do you tell them to like get, get back on track it is pretty easy, you know, go to rehab, do all that. But like, how do you say, because nobody's got the right answer because I think it's such an epidemic in America right now. Nobody's got that one answer. I mean, it's different for everybody, but what would you tell somebody? I think, well, you said it. I mean, going to rehab in these groups and these, these circles of people who are basically on the same level going through similar circumstances is really vital. Mm -hmm. I'd be dead long ago if it weren't for the love of my mother and family, my wife today, they are on my team. Yeah. 
you know, they keep me up when I'm down and then I can keep them up when they're down. It's this community of passionate people that are happy to be here and grateful and live with a reverence for life. And what you just said, I'm interrupting, is everything you're explaining is what an AA meeting and NA meeting is. Everybody that is so joyful for being sober and they're willing to help the new person that's coming in those doors and that's why you have to work at sobriety every single day by going to meetings every day if you have to. That's going to make you sober that day and then get through that day, worry about tomorrow when it comes. But that's, that's how we do it, right? We yeah. lean on those mm -hmm. and trust those that are there and be humble and fragile enough to let go of your ego and your pride and the bullshit that's in your head and just work it together because we're so much stronger when, the, we, when we share this. The biggest thing what you just said is being humble and I tell a lot of people that, you know, when you go into like rehab and you think you know everything, like you don't know who I am, I like it. Those are the people, what I've seen is every single time they're gonna go back out. They're like the most really fragile. Being humble, being okay. I'm okay with saying that I like taking bubble baths every night, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm okay with it. I'm okay with being a little softer. I know like I live that lifestyle, but I'm okay with myself. I, I couldn't do it on my own. I, I need help from other people. It's just that's Even a if you're big not, thing yeah. is humble. I think that's like number one. And that's it. Even if you're not okay and you're feeling super insecure and it's hard, just Put yourself in that environment where you can just set that shit down. Mm -hmm. Be human. That's the bottom line. We all are in this together. We're all struggling. Don't on care something. what other people think. Just worry about you. and Take care of yourself first so that you're strong enough to take care of others. Mm -hmm. And then, again, that's cyclical. That's symbiotic. That goes around and comes around. And then there's a huge purpose in all that. And you become powerful in that process and your light gets brighter and you're shining it on someone else and they start shining, it's like, dude, it's really powerful. So if I could tell anybody, lean on your, your group, your community. If you don't have anybody, family, friends, find that meeting, find that group. Latch on to one, if, if only one. And keep going till you find that one. A lot of people, I've been to one, dude, it, for me it took a couple times till you found that good group of people, so. And that's where it comes back. Don't give up. Keep going until you find that one. And you nailed it on the head. Where can people find you other than your Netflix movie? What's your Instagram? Is that a good way for people um, yeah. to reach out? I mean, social media is the way. Yeah. Uh, recently um, sold the business that I founded with my mom, Core. Uh, and now I'm doing my own thing. So social media is the best way to get me. I'm Aaron Baker. Um, I'm AaronBaker.com website. So before we close it down, we kind of skipped that, like on top of doing this, that you started a business core, which was uh, kind of explain it. What it's, it was. It was rehab. rehab I mean, basically, for, it was for people that have injuries, bad injuries. Yeah. I mean, basically anybody living with um, a physical condition could go into the facility and access the equipment and the trainers and the environment and improve their health and fitness and I know a, a lot of people went there and it, it helped so much but if you didn't go through that injury and all this they would not have had that so it's crazy all the lives you've touched by the situation you just made the best of what cards you were dealt man and you're living a great life right now man thank you well really again are. the key is the people that you surround yourself with it's number one you're the sum of the top five bud and you're in my top five you're in my top five too, dude. Thank you so much. This was a great interview, you guys. I mean, he's a uh, living proof, you know, just get back up, never give up, ride the rut. That's it, man. Check out his documentary. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, guys. We're out.